I'm Gary and this is episode 114 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at plug and charge technology. What is it? How does it work? And why do we want it? This season of the podcast is sponsored by Zapmap. Before we start, I wanted to say that I hope everyone had a great new year. At the time of recording, I have no idea what I'll be doing, nor for that matter what most people in the UK will be doing for New Year's. So, fingers crossed it all turns out right. Our main topic of discussion today is plug and charge. Say what you like about Tesla, and many people do, but since day one they've produced the best and so far unmatched charging experience. You pull into a Tesla supercharger, grab the charger connector, approach the car, the charge flap unlocks, and you plug it in. And that's it. There's nothing else to worry about. The connector does the handshake, the car starts charging. No cards to wave, no apps to download, no payment methods to sort. Heck, None of the Tesla superchargers even have a screen on them. Everything's done in the car. The reason this works so well, and one of the USPs for Tesla's charging offering, is the concept of plug and charge. Every Tesla and every supercharger was designed to work on the plug and charge system. When the connector hits the charge socket, the charger and the car converse with each other. They recognise what the car is, who owns it, which Tesla account is responsible for payment for it, and it also recognises whether you're getting free supercharging linked to the car if appropriate. And then the charge just starts. Almost without exception, whenever this topic comes up, everyone is in favour of it being implemented everywhere. It makes so much sense, and it removes a lot of the barriers that exist at the moment with EV charging. Different charging procedures, multiple payment methods, apps, contactless payments, websites, preloading payment cards, RFID tokens, etc. Given the multiple comments, issues and complaints that other EV drivers have about the charging infrastructure, why is plug and charge not a standard on all EV chargers? Well, the reasons are many and varied, and we'll go into that in a minute. But it would be remiss of me to talk about this subject without first acknowledging that plug and charge does already exist to some extent for a couple of charge point operators. Fastnet, the Dutch based operators who are expanding into the UK, run a version of plug and charge. They call it auto charge, and it's compatible with CCS connectors only. Except it's not. If you run one of the cars that appears on a quite long list, the auto charge won't work at Fastnet. This list includes, includes pretty much all the Volkswagen Audi Group EVs, so Audi, Volkswagen, Seat and Skoda, as well as the Mazda, Maxus and DS range. Anything other than that though, and you're good, providing it's CCS, which cuts out the Nissans and the Kia Soul that I have too. To make it work, all you do is set up an account in their app, do an initial charge with your car using the app, and this sets up the connection. After that, you just have to plug and go. As long as it's not a Volkswagen Audi Group car, a Mazda, a Chadamo car, or a Citroen DS. ChargePoint operator Ionity also has plug and charge. Well, to be precise, Ionity has chargers which support the plug and charge protocol known as ISO 15118. We'll be talking about that a little in a minute. Unfortunately, under this protocol, both the vehicle and the charger have to work together to do the handshake and make things work. This means that, at the moment, only a certain number of vehicles have the correct pr- protocol in place. These are the Porsche Taycan, the Lucid Air, and the Rivian R1T. It appears that the VW ID range is looking to get this implemented soon with a new over-the-air update. But even if you get the protocol on your car, it means you can only use it on the Ionity network, which is, on an ad hoc basis, the most expensive in Europe at almost three times the price of Tesla supercharging at the time of recording. So how do we deal with this? Well, as I've already mentioned, plug and charge is a protocol which determines communication between a car and a charger. In that way, it's no different to the CCS charging standard. Cast your mind back to a few years ago when CCS connectors were added to chargers. The number of times cars such as the BMW i3, the I-Pace and similar were unable to charge because the handshake between the car and the charger didn't work. And this with ISO 15118 is a similar issue. For the ISO 15118 to work, both the charger and the car have to have the protocol implemented and ready to go. And as I mentioned already, there aren't a great number of cars that have this at the moment. But what about the other side of the equation? What about the chargers? Tritium, ABB and Kempower are three charger manufacturers who account for the majority of the chargers in use today. Tritium have plug and charge functionality on their new RT175S units, which deliver 175 kilowatts of charge speed. They've also pushed out a software patch to retroactively update all their 50 kilowatt chargers to plug and play capability. If you're charging using one of the Tritium V-Fill PK units, 
it will automatically have plug and charge available. ABB and Kempower, however, don't appear to have embraced this technology at all, just yet. But there is a new kid on the block, Alpitronic. It has gone for plug and charge on its newer chargers, particularly the HYC300 units, which can deliver 75 kilowatts to 300 kilowatt rapid charging for vehicles. But again, this is dependent on the vehicle having that sort of protocol installed. As mentioned earlier, for the Ionity chargers, there are only three vehicles with this sort of protocol installed, and these are Porsche Taycan, the Lucid Air, and the Rivian. Not even Tesla has a plug and charge installed for operations outside the supercharger network. One of the reasons there's some sort of issue is the payment method. With plug and play, the whole unique selling point is that you don't need to worry about sorting out a payment method. The cost is charged automatically to some payment method that you already have on file linked to the car. In just the same way as Tesla needs you to have your car registered to an account with a payment method attached to it, any of the ISO 15118 compliance systems will need some link to an account that connects the car to a payment method. At the moment, that's handled using the apps on systems such as the Fastnet Auto Charge and Ionity's Plug and Charge system. The key issue with getting Plug and Charge implemented is understanding that the actual payment process itself. It works through the use of tokens, which are electronic records that link a specific vehicle to a specific payment method. Unfortunately, the payment method at the moment is CPO specific. That means that if you want universal plug and charge, you'll need tokens for every charge point operator you might conceivably visit. One for Osprey, one for Instavolt, one for GridServe, etc. This then creates an issue with managing them, storing them, and authenticating them. But this will all be worked out eventually. In an ideal world, there would be one system where this is set up and you can use it wherever you plug into a compliant charger. In reality, I can see each network having their own app which you'd need to use to connect a payment method. Of course, the light at the end of the tunnel with things like this would be something like ZapPay or Octopus Juice, which consolidates multiple charger networks to one payment source. If every network were on ZapPay, for example, you could use whichever one you wanted and the ISO 15118 protocol would link the relevant network to your ZapPay account and charge using that particular token. Over and above the fact that plug and charge is much more convenient than having to faff around with ads or apps, one key benefit it will give is the ability to deal with wireless charging. At the moment, the sophisticated software required with wireless charging to do essentially what the ISO 15118 standard will do automatically. As we discussed in our episode on wireless charging, the issue with this is that each manufacturer will have to speak to all of the other manufacturers to ensure that the correct wireless protocol is implemented in their vehicles. It will also mean additional hardware being implemented in vehicles, and all this will, unfortunately, increase cost. In summary, plug and charge is something of a holy grail. However, the technology is there, at both the vehicle and charger level, to allow this to happen. There are a number of steps which need to take place for this to become widespread. This includes ensuring all vehicles accept the protocol, and new charges are designed according to the protocol. If this happens, the dream of plug and charge is a dream no more be just like the Tesla superchargers. Pull up, plug in, done. It's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. It's been a while since we discussed electric boats, but news comes of a new schooner which combines sails and an electric motor to get the maximum range and efficiency from a large ship. Sail Cargo is gearing up to launch the flagship of a future fleet set to revolutionise freight transportation. The 150-foot vessel is built of wood and powered by sail, but it also features an electric engine for extra power on its long journeys. Designed as a three-masted topsail schooner inspired by traditional boats, the Seba features a sail area that's big enough to allow it to move even in very light winds, while also being easy to manoeuvre during challenging weather conditions. It's also equipped with an auxiliary electric engine that kicks in when extra power is needed. The batteries will be charged either from solar panels or with the regenerative energy resulted from the dual propellers acting as underwater turbines. We like this. The EV Musings podcast is sponsored by ZapMap. ZapMap is the go-to app for EV drivers in the UK. Use it to search for available chargers, plan electric journeys, pay for charging on participating networks, and share updates with other EV drivers. ZapMap is free to download and use, with subscription plans for enhanced features, such as using ZapMap in-car on CarPlay or Android Auto. And that's your show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. 
If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at evmusings at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at MusingTV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, and who wouldn't, please consider contributing to become an EV Musings patron. The link's in the show notes. If you don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis, why not go to coffee.com slash evmusings and buy me a coffee? That's ko-fi.com slash evmusings. And it takes Apple Pay too. If you want a quick reference ebook to read on your Kindle, I wrote a little something called So You've Gone Electric. It's available on Amazon worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent and is a great little introduction to living with an electric car. Please check it out. Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you so much. Why not let me know you've got to this point by tweeting me at MusingZV with the words plugged and charged. Hashtag, if you know, you know. Nothing else. Thanks as always to my co-founder, Simon. You know he deserves a bit of peace and quiet over the holiday period. Hi, Simon. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.